Hello, church family. How's everybody doing today? Happy Father's Day to all of our people that helped raise children in any type of way. We thank you. <laughs> As we get settled in here, you all know, don't get too comfortable. I gave you the warning. Most people sat anyways. I gave you the warning. You know we're going to stand up, Matt, Cash. So go ahead and stand on up. As people filter in, we prepare for worship today and youth worship and announcements. Let's go ahead and sing us a song. Let's praise God. Somebody's called in my name. Somebody's called in my name. Somebody's calling. You know that somebody's calling. Somebody's calling my name. Well, I'm going home on the morning train. I'm going home on the morning train. I'm going home. You know that I'm going home. I'm going home on the morning train. That evening train might be too late. Evening train might be too late. Evening train, you know that evening train. Evening train might be too late. So back, back train and get your load. Back, back train and get your load. Back, back train, you better back, back train. Come on now, back, back train and get your load. So get right, church, and let's go home. Get right, church, and let's go home. Get right, church, you better get right, church. Come on and get right, church, and let's go home. Be seated, church. Good morning, church. That was okay, but we're going to try again. Good morning, church. Good morning, Aiden. It's already been said, but I want to wish everyone a happy Father's Day. Um, for all the men who have raised children, um, who are biological fathers, but also for the men who have played the role of spiritual father. Uh, we're going to celebrate that today. And so uh, from the bottom of my heart, because I know there are a lot of people who have played that role in my life, thank you. We love you. Um, actually, before, before we move on, I want to say a prayer. Um, so let's bow and let's pray together. Father, you are good. And... Father, in this moment, I am just, I'm mindful and I'm thankful um, for the spiritual guidance uh, that many of us have received in our lives. Uh, God, I'm thankful uh, for the mothers and for the fathers and for the spiritual mothers and for the spiritual fathers, um, God, that have sought to be like you and have sought to care for and tend to uh, the spiritual lives of us children. And God, specifically today, we want to honor those fathers who, um, in many ways, made a lot of sacrifices on our behalf. Um, and God, who uh, may have sought to do that in a way that honors you. And so, God, we honor those men today, and we thank you for them. Um, God, as we continue with our service this morning, I pray uh, that what we lift up to you is uh, honoring to you. Because, God, you are the only one worthy to receive that praise. We love you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. The church said, amen. amen. So I have a few announcements, and by a few I mean five. First announcement is that Life Group, okay? Life Group for the month of June is going to be next Sunday, June 25th. Woo! Woo! Right? Yeah, life group for the month of June is going to be next Sunday, okay? So if you have not 
made plans to join us for Life Group on the 25th. Here's what I'm going to tell you right now. Everybody pay attention. Make plans to join us for Life Group on the 25th. Everyone heard me? There are a lot of distractions in here, a lot of cute kids in here that could draw your attention away from what I'm saying. Make plans to join us next week. Aaron's going to be leading group. We're going to be talking about prayer. And we're going to be talking about prayer through the lens of abiding in Jesus and abiding in God, maintaining that relational connection with him. So join us for that. It's going to be good. We're going to share a meal together. There is no theme for the meal, so just bring good food. Be sure to let Amy know what you're bringing so that we don't have a bunch of people all bringing the same stuff. Okay? That's June. And then for the month of July... Life group for the month of July will be on July 23rd. Okay, everybody hear me? What day is group? July 23rd. There we go. So be sure to join us for that. David will be leading that group. We're going to be talking about spiritual parenting. Okay, so come on, be a part of that. That's going to be awesome. That is life group. Next, okay, all through the month of June, we are doing a a food drive for clothed in righteousness. Okay, so... There are lists of the food that they need on the table in the back, the big table. Be sure to grab one of those lists if you have not yet. The last week we're going to be collecting food for that drive is next Sunday. So be sure to grab a list. Uh, I know I saw a lot of kids with food that they're ready to bring up here during youth worship, so that's awesome. Uh, But go ahead and prepare for that for next week, because next week is the last week that we're doing that for the month of June. Uh, This coming Wednesday on the 21st, There is a suicide prevention training being held at Rodman Library. Uh, The training is free and open to the public. So um, if you guys are interested in that, there is an information sheet on the bulletin board in the back. You can sign up online for that. If you have any questions, is Ann in here right now? No? Is she coming today? Okay. If you have any questions, I'll try and answer them to the best of my ability. You can come and talk to me at the end of services today. Okay? Next thing, um, during the months of July and August, we're going to be switching up our worship order um, with the hope of uh, creating an environment that's better for our kids in terms of transitions and things like that. So um, we'll be giving you more information as we approach that next week. Uh, But July and August, we're going to be doing that change to our worship order to see if that offers more benefit to our children. We're going to be doing a survey following that, so please keep your ears and eyes open for that survey because we covet your feedback, okay? Last thing, if you have any prayer requests this morning, you can post them in the comments on Facebook Live or you can text them to Sam Driver. His phone number is 614-601-1598 and Sam will pray over those things at the conclusion of our service today. Announcements, am I right? Yeah. All right, on to youth worship. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How is everyone doing today? How about y'all online? You doing well? I hope you're doing well. Kids, I love you too. And I love you, and I love you, and I even love you. (laughs) Hey, so today is Father's Day. Yay, Father's Day. Oh, yeah, so cool, so cool. And where I'd like to begin is with a song about a very famous father. He was a father of fathers who fathered many fathers. No, not that dad. His name is Father Abraham. Let's stand on up. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I'm one of them and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham, I'm one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham, I'm one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, right leg, Father Abraham. And many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. 
So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, right leg, left leg. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, right leg, left leg. Head up, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, right leg, left leg. Head up, spin around, sit down. Oh, oh gosh. Woo. I am exhausted. Sheesh, all that movement. Did anyone start an activity ring on their Apple Watch? I almost had to. Oh, hey, hey, so Abraham was a father of many fathers, but he has his lineage going all the way back to a man and a woman named Adam and Eve. And last time, when we gathered together, we talked about Adam and Eve in creation. But today, we're going to talk about how Adam and Eve disobeyed their father. Sometimes, sometimes dads and father figures have to discipline us because we're not listening to them. We're not obeying what they've asked out of us. Like, for instance, let's run a test. Let's just say, let's just say you broke something in your house. <gasps> What do you do? Ready? Here's the test. Here's the test. Be careful. Other people are watching. You have to tell the truth. <clears throat> do you A, not tell anyone, B, blame it on your sister or brother, or C, go and tell an adult? Which one is it? Hmm. Hmm. It's the last one. Aiden, what do you think? It sounds like you have personal experience with this, Aiden. <laughs> and that's, that's part of what we're going to learn about today. Yes, Jace, what's up? Yeah, you need to go tell the parents. That's the right answer. Yes, Saya. Is that the right answer? Yeah, that's the right answer. Yeah, hey, y'all are passing the test. And we're going to learn more about that, of how we need to obey God in heaven. Because listen, guys, y'all, we're, we're almost going to let you go. God loves you. And, and God is a perfect father. Hi, Hank. Man, that made me happy. So... God loves you. He wants, to, he wants you to obey because he wants the best for you. And he will discipline you to ensure that you learn his will. So let's obey. Let's see how quietly you can obey. Ready? I want to invite you up to donate to Clothed in Righteousness. Shh. How quietly can you do it? Shh. Go give. Oh, good job. Good job. Shh. Quiet, quiet, quiet. Go and hug Dustin. Go and hug and high five Dustin. Good job. Bye, I love you. And just a reminder, church. For those of you who are now past that age, your God loves you too. He is worthy of our worship. Let's continue in praise to him. All right, church, you already know. Stand on up. Stand on up. Let's keep praising God here. <clears throat>
To you, O oh Lord, I lift up my soul. In you, my God, I put my trust. Show me your ways and teach me your path. Remember, O oh Lord, you're my King. To you, O oh Lord, I lift up my soul. In you, my God, I put my trust. Show me your ways and teach me your path. Remember, O oh Lord, remember, O oh Lord, remember, O oh Lord, you're my King, the God of the heaven, the Ancient of Days, the God of our Father. come to lay our lives down we will have no other gods before you nothing on earth will compete for your throne you are the sovereign i am and you reign in our hearts alone we will exalt you on high forever king of all kings and the lord of all lords we will have no other gods before you, our maker, creator, before time began, Messiah and Savior, Redeemer and friend, a rock of salvation. So faithful and true, we give all the glory and honor to you, for you alone are worthy of our never-ending love. We will have no other gods before you. Nothing on earth will compete for your throne. You are the sovereign I am, and you reign in our hearts alone. We will exalt you on high forever, King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. We will have no other gods before you. We will have no other gods before you. Nothing on earth will compete for your throne. You are the sovereign I am, and you reign in our hearts alone. We will exalt you on high forever. King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. We will have no other gods before you. This is going to be our song uh, before communion. <clears throat> As a deer. As the deer. As the deer. For the water, Lord. For the water, Lord. So my soul. My soul yes, my longs after you, longs after you, and I pour out my soul deep within me, deep within me. I pour out my soul. Draw me deeper, Lord, deep.
Good morning again, everyone. Oh, without the kids in here, you guys lose all your energy. Good morning, everyone. There it is. Okay, so um, I have a couple of things to share, and then we're going to pray and dive into the lesson for today. The first thing I need to share, um, David Woofter texted me after the announcements and wanted to remind everyone that the guys group gathering for the month of July will be at his house on Saturday, July 15th in the year of our Lord, 2023. Okay? And Marcella, I keep forgetting. And Marcella's house. They, are, they have co-ownership of that property. Okay? So uh, there will be more details to follow about that event uh, as we get closer. But fellas, mark your calendars for July 15th of 2023, which is this year in about a month, okay? Everybody good with that? And then Ben texted me uh, after I gave the announcement about the worship order change where I said, we covet your feedback, and he said this, please stop coveting my feedback. The Bible says, thou shalt not covet. (laughs) So I need to repent and just let you all know that We would very much enjoy it if you gave feedback, but coveting is wrong. So there you go. Um, Let's, with joking aside, let's pray and then we'll dive into today's lesson. Father God, you are you are good and you are loving and you are holy and you are mighty. God, you are gracious and merciful and kind, and God, there is none like you. God, I'm thankful for this opportunity that we have this morning to gather as your children, as a people, uh, to give you praise, because there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. God, as we spend some time in your word this morning, I pray Uh, God, that this place might be full of your spirit. God, that your spirit would open up our hearts and our minds and our ears. God, that we would not just hear this message. God, that we would not just understand this message, but that we would, through understanding, put it into practice. God, that um, as has been the goal of this whole series that we've been working through, we might we might gain deeper understanding for the purpose of action. God, be with me as I speak. Move me out of the way. Um, God, may the words that are spoken this morning be yours and not mine. Father, I love you, and I pray these things in Jesus' name. The church said, amen. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 is where we're going to be this morning. We are not going to be looking through several passages. We're just going to be centrally located here in Ephesians chapter 4. You are very welcome. 
I, I hear the, the thunderous applause as a thank you for that, so you're all very welcome. Uh, before we get to that, though, um, we have another word that we're going to define today. It's a word that is not just tossed around in church context, it's tossed around uh, in psychology context, in uh, physical medicine context, and that is the word mature. How many of you guys have heard the word mature? Yes? Okay, so the definition that we're going to use today in a spiritual context for the word mature is that you are developed to the most advanced stage in a process of growth. I'll say that again. If someone is mature, they have developed to the most advanced stage in a process of growth. Does everybody understand that? So if I am in stage one of 10 stages, am I mature? No. If I am in stage two, am I more mature than I was in stage one? Yeah, right? And so the goal is that we would continue to mature, to continue to try and reach a goal when it comes to maturity, that we would continue to advance and grow. Okay? Everybody follow? So today, what I want to do is I want to trek through the first 16 verses of Ephesians chapter 4, and then what we'll do next week is we're going to finish Ephesians chapter 4. Cool? Cool. Okay, so in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, this is what Paul has to say. I, therefore, oh, does that word, therefore, and remember, if the, there's a therefore, we've got to look before the therefore to see what the therefore is therefore. Okay, so this is chapter 4 out of six chapters. So Paul is about halfway through his letter. And in the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, Paul has begun to outline for his readers, for this church in Ephesus that he's writing to, what Christ has done for us. That we have been predestined for adoption as sons that we have an inheritance in heaven, that he is working on us, that we have been saved by grace, that we now have a place in his kingdom, that we have a place as a part of the household of God. Like These are things that Paul has outlined for this church so that they might have a clear understanding of what Jesus Christ has done on their behalf. And so in light of those things that God has done, that Jesus has done, for us, so that we might no longer be found in death, but that we might have life. So that we might no longer be strangers and aliens, but that we might be members of the household of God. In light of those things, Paul says this in chapter 4, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. I urge you, I plead with you, I beg you, To walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now, again, what Paul is doing here is he is he's now talking about the actions that we have to take. He's now talking about the expectations that are on us as followers of Jesus. But again, what did Paul do before he laid out expectations? He laid out a new reality, he laid out a new identity. He laid out everything that God, through Jesus Christ, has done for us because he loves us. So before expectation has been laid out at all, Paul shares with this church the gospel. And now he's saying, in light of that message, here's what I'm asking of you. And not just what I'm asking of you, but if we go all the way back to Matthew 28, we see that Jesus has asked this of us. Yes? So this is not Paul's expectation. This is the expectation that has been placed on us by Jesus Christ. Paul is just relaying it. But again, that is all in light of all of this good stuff that God has done for us. He says, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now, if you remember a couple weeks ago, we looked through a passage in Galatians 5, and we looked through a uh, a passage in Colossians 3. And I mentioned that there was a word in both of those passages for it's the greek word for walk does anyone remember what that word is i doubt it peri potato yes love it hairy potato right you guys remember that hairy potato okay this is that word 
So Paul is not just talking about actually physically walking. He's talking about conducting ourselves in a certain manner of life. This is, our, this is our spiritual walk that he is talking about. This is a new life that we have been invited into to walk in. And so he says, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. He's giving us an expectation that we have been invited into this new life. How are we supposed to live? Are we supposed to live as we did when we were walking in our old way? No. Yes. Good, good, good. We should be walking differently than we were before. And so he says in verse 2, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So before... Because we were walking, and again, I apologize to everyone that's sitting here. This is just where it was. This was the bad path. You guys remember the bad path? All the bad things? Yeah, Sam's moving. He's like, forget this path. I'm done with it. All of these things broke relationship. They broke peace in our relationships. These behaviors that are characterized by sin and characterized by our fleshly nature... We look, and the kids are talking about it today in their class. We look all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. God gives a command. One command. Look, you can eat of every tree, every bush, every plant that bears fruit in this garden. You can eat that fruit. Just don't eat this one. But Satan comes along, and he tricks Adam and Eve. And what do they do? They do the one thing that God asked them not to do. And in so doing, they rebelled and found themselves on a path. They found themselves separated from God because of what they had done. These actions that are characterized and marked by sin, they break relationship. And so we are being called to a new manner of life, to a better way of life, a way of life that is marked by things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And because there's no law against these things, we can conclude that these things offer benefit and life to our relationships. They mend relationship instead of breaking it. They offer healthier relationships instead of unhealthy ones. And so Paul says here that we should be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That this way of life leads to unity and peace. Now, unity is an interesting concept. Because often I think when we hear the word unity, <clears throat> what we conclude in our head is what, well, what Paul is really trying to say here is he wants us to be uniform. He wants uniformity. That we all be exactly the same. That there be no differences among any of us. But is that the word that he uses? Is that the message that he's trying to convey? No. He's not trying to convey that we should all be uniform. As a matter of fact, unity assumes difference. The, concept, the whole concept of unity assumes that we have our differences and yet we still come together. Does everybody understand that? I have family members. God bless them. That are Democrats. But wait, but wait, but wait. I have family members, God bless them, that are Republicans. And I have family members that are independent. I have family members that could not give a lick about American politics. They don't care at all. I have family members that are Steelers fans. And I have family members that are Browns fans. I have family members that don't like pizza. 
Say it ain't so, Lord. I can forgive you if you're a Democrat. I can forgive you if you're a Republican. I can forgive you if you're independent. I can forgive you if you don't care about politics. But not liking pizza. That's just not American. Nor is it Christian. Now, these are all jokes. But let's turn the dial up a little bit. We live in a world where the, the forces that be, and I'm not talking about politicians or people in power, I'm talking about Satan, attempts to identify those differences and magnify them so that we will not stand unified. Where we will focus more on our differences than we will on what unites us. Where we will let those little things, and church, they are little things. We will let those little things tear apart our relationships. But there is one thing for all of us that have professed a faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord, that unites us. And that is his blood that covers us. Whether you are a Republican or a Democrat, whether you like pizza or you don't like pizza, whether you are a Steelers fan or a Browns fan, regardless of the differences that this world will try to keep up and magnify so that we can stand apart from one another, there is one thing that unites all of us, and that is Jesus Christ and him crucified, and his blood that covers us, and the life that he offers us. And we have done a terrible job as a people of uniting because we are so focused on those things that divide us. And so Paul's plea here is that we would be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And then he says this, there is... Say it with me. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One, sorry, you guys go. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. We have been called to unite over these things, these ones. Because there are not two lords. There are not two fates. There's one. And yet so many of us, I mean, look at, look at our church today and how mangled it is. Not the Alliance Church. I'm just talking about in general. How many denominations are there in the faith? Too many to count. Because we identify one thing we disagree on and we're like, well, let's split. Right? You do your thing, I'll do my thing. And we call it unity. That's not what Jesus prays for in John 17 as he's about to go and be crucified. He prays that his people might be one as he and the Father are one. And this is the desire. This is the hope. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And so again, I'm going to come back to this. All the way back in verse 1, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And I think the context that Paul gives in the verses that follow, he's not just talking about, hey guys, quit, quit sinning and start doing this good stuff. He's also encouraging them to be unified. To not spend so much time dividing 
but spend more time focusing on how we can come together. Because again, unity assumes difference. We all have differences of opinion. But we all have one thing that unites us, right? And that is Jesus Christ. So what comes from that then? Verse 11, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. He gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers, and what is their job? To equip. And church, I'll stand before you today knowing that we've already made this confession to you. But in many ways, the leadership at Alliance recognizes that we've not done this well. And in some cases, we're still not doing this well. But this is our job. This is our job is to equip you My job is to equip you because it's not just my job to do this work. It's your job to do this work because if you are a disciple of Jesus, what is the call for you? The call for you is to go out and do the work of ministry, to go and make disciples. It's not just my call to make disciples And then I go out and make more disciples, and then I go out and make more disciples. The call is that I would make disciples, and then those disciples would go and make disciples. My job, Charlie's job, Joe's job, is to equip you to do the work of ministry. For the building up of the body of Christ. For the sake of unity, which he says here again in verse 13. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. So what is the goal? The goal is that I would equip you to go out and do this work. The goal is that I would walk beside you while you do this work. The goal is that I would prepare your mind to understand that the reason we do this work is not so that we could go out and all do our own thing, but to unify under the one thing that Jesus has called us to. That we would all attain to the unity of the faith, to the knowledge of the Son of God, which is another key thing. And I don't think he's just talking about knowledge about the Son of God. That I'm like a super fan of Jesus where I can just stand up here and be like, hey guys, let me tell you all the stats. Let me tell you how many people Jesus healed. Like I'm a fan of Michael Jordan or something and I can tell you his career like free throw percentage or his three-point shooting percentage. Or how many dunks he had. Or how many playoff points he had. I can know a whole bunch of stuff about Michael Jordan, but what could also be true? I don't know Michael Jordan. I could know the words that are in this book and do exactly what Jesus told the Pharisees. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And yet you've not come to me. You've not seen me. You've not recognized me that you may have life. Like, I could, I could memorize everything about Jesus and not know Jesus at all. So until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, the whole point of this is that we would grow. The whole point of this is that we would mature. The whole point of this is that each of us would be taking steps forward in growth. And again, I've talked about this before, but I think this is so, so true. How many of us have sat here for years and years and years, or days and months and weeks, and and we're not growing because we're not taking steps. We're not doing what Jesus has asked. We're doing what we want, and we're putting a Jesus name tag on it. The goal is to grow to mature manhood, to the measure of of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So what is, what is that thing that we're trying to reach in terms of growth? What is the measurement? 
What am I trying to reach? Say it. Jesus. As I'm trying to grow, as I'm trying to mature, as I lean into this process of sanctification, as I lean into this process of transformation, where daily I'm submitting to the Spirit of God, the whole goal is not that you would look like me. The whole goal is not that you would look like these, you know, awesome preachers or awesome church leaders. The whole goal is not that you would look like Paul. Not that you would look like Peter. Not that you would look like John or Timothy or Barnabas or any of these guys. Who were they all trying to look like? Jesus. And if we're following in their footsteps, who should we be trying to look like? Jesus. That's the goal. That's the measurement. That is what I'm trying to reach. And the only way I do that is if I continually lean into that process so that I might mature. I'll continue. Verse 14. So that we may no longer be children. This is why Paul says we should be aiming to mature. So that we may no longer be children. Tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, and deceitful schemes. Now, I just, want to, I just want to pause here. There is a reason why all of us are called to grow up in the faith. There is a reason why all of us are called to mature. And Paul lays it out right here. If I am not growing in my faith, what am I? I am a spiritual what? Child. And what is the danger of me being a spiritual child? I can be tossed to and fro by the waves. When trouble comes, I'm not able to stand firm. Because I'm weak. Because I don't have a solid foundation. And I can be tossed to and fro when trouble comes. Or I can be carried about by every wind of doctrine. If I don't know Jesus and I don't know the teachings of Jesus and I'm not aiming to grow in the teachings of Jesus. Which, by the way, can happen right here in this moment. But if it's only happening right here in this moment, are you getting enough? It's a, it's a word that has two letters and it starts with N. No. You're not getting enough if you're coming to this moment and you're thinking, this is what's going to get me through the crazy week in the world that we live in. I'm just going to go and listen to Dustin talk at me for 30 minutes and then I'll be good. No. What should you be doing so that you're not carried about by every wind of doctrine? How do we learn about the teachings of Jesus? How do we know what he expects from us and what he calls us to? How do we know? How do we know? It's right here. But as we talked about in Charlie's group a couple weeks ago, it is staggering how many Christians have never even picked up this book. How are we supposed to grow in maturity if we're not reading what Jesus has called us to? If we're not, and not just that, if we're not getting to know him. How am I supposed to stand firm when trouble comes? And how am I supposed to know what is true and what is false? I can't. Because there are some things that the world is tossing out that people are like, ah, that's pretty convincing. The problem is they're not in this book. The problem is they're not true, but they're convincing. And they sound good because it sounds like I don't have to, you know, make any sacrifices. I get to keep on sinning so that grace may increase. And that's not what the scriptures teach. 
I can be carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. In less than a month, I'm going to be teaching a class at camp. The theme for the week is fearless. And we're going to be talking to the kids that are at camp about how to overcome fear and anxiety and worry and doubt. And the class that I'm teaching is being fearless in the face of temptation. And we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 4 about Jesus' temptation and how Jesus confronts Satan in the midst of that temptation. And you guys know that in that context, as Satan is beginning to tempt Jesus, what's one of the methods that Satan uses to tempt Jesus? He quotes what to him? Scripture. He quotes Scripture. And then, if you go all the way back to Genesis 3, again, what our kids are talking about today, what does Satan use to trip up Eve? Did God really say this? You said God said this, but did he really say that? And if I'm not maturing in the faith, And I'm not growing up to the point where I'm trying to attain to the fullness of the measure of Christ. And I'm not spending time in the word to learn it and to grow in it and to be changed by it, to to have it act as a mirror, as James talks about, where I am seeing the areas of my life that need changing and I'm leaning in and changing those things by the power of the Spirit of God. If I'm not doing that and I'm not growing, guys, here's something you need to know about the enemy. He knows the scriptures better than you know the scriptures. It's like going out onto a football field and playing a team that has your playbook. And then when you line up in a certain formation, they know exactly what you're doing before you even snap the ball. And they can get into position and they can stop you. And that's incredibly difficult if you haven't even studied your own playbook. But how does Jesus combat that temptation from Satan? What does Jesus know better than Satan knows it? The Word of God. And so as Satan throws the Word of God at Jesus, what is Jesus able to do? Not so fast. That's not what it says. And even if that is what it says, Satan, you're sorely mistaken because you're trying to take it out of context to trip me. And so the goal is that I would spend so much time with Jesus in his word, in prayer, that he is actively changing me, that I am maturing so that day by day I look more and more like him. So that when Satan brings those schemes to the table, which by the way, guys, Some of the tricks that he has, if you look in Matthew 4 and you look in Genesis chapter 1, it's the same trick. It's the same trick. But for those that don't know how to combat it, it's easy to trip us up. Which is why Paul in Ephesians 6 doesn't just talk about all of these other pieces of armor that are meant to protect us from the devil's schemes. He also talks about the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The word of God. And is this sword just meant for me to hold up and like, not today, Satan, and I'm defending myself? What can I also do with this sword of the Spirit? Not today, Satan, back off. Get away from me. To where I'm able to see when he's trying to deceive But because of the maturity that I have in Christ, because of the fact that I've given myself over to him, because of the fact that he is continually working on me and changing me from the inside out, those schemes that used to trip me up, I'm not a child anymore. Like, here's here's another way of putting it. Do we have any kids in here? No? Okay. Listen. Everybody listen. 
when you were really young and people told you about the Easter Bunny, you were like, man, he was real because he brought me a basket with chocolate eggs, which is kind of like when you think about the whole system, like I've never known a rabbit to lay eggs, let alone chocolate eggs, but he's magic, so who knows, right? I was three. I was like, this is real. But then there was a point when I grew up a little bit and I was able to think critically. And some of the kids that we have here are a lot smarter than I was at that age. You guys are doing a great job. I was like seven before I was like, okay, maybe this is a little fishy. (laughs) How long is it going to take for us to continue to get tripped up by Satan before we're like, you know what? I probably should stop doing that. I should probably grow up a little bit. He continues, rather, speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. Everybody follow? Speaking the truth in love is how I'm to approach you. I need to tell you the truth. But I'm not going to do it by beating you over the head with this book. That accomplishes nothing. So I'm going to tell you the truth, but I'm going to do so in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. From whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now, this is interesting because Paul is starting to blend two things together here. He's not just talking about me maturing as an individual. How else is he talking about me maturing? As a part of what? The body of Christ, which is what? The church. So this whole, like, I can do this myself, it's me and God, me and Jesus thing, I don't, you can search the pages of scripture, I don't see it. I am not just to mature by myself. Now, am I to, be, am I to mature, me, me and Jesus, I spend time with Jesus, I grow up, I mature? Absolutely. But how else are we to mature, church? As a part of the body, together. Because I have blind spots, There are ways that Satan can deceive me that right now I can't see, but you might. And speaking the truth in love, you can go, hey, Dustin, listen, I think that was a little misguided. I think maybe Satan is trying to lie to you. I think maybe Satan is trying to trick you. I think Satan's already at your table and you're eating with him. And I love you, so I'm going to warn you that that's, that's not a good idea. Because it could put you back into a place that you don't want to be in. Whereas you start taking his guidance instead of the guidance of Jesus, you're going to start to see that your life leaves nothing but destruction behind it. And so I'm not just called to mature by myself. I'm called into community where you guys have my back and I have your back. You guys lift me up, I lift you up. And together, we grow. Together, we mature. What church do you think is more effective in the mission of Jesus? A church that is just a bunch of individuals that are aimless and have no idea what's going on or a church that is growing together as a body and maturing together. Understanding the call of Christ. Understanding the love of Christ and what that love calls us to. And so, what is a critical goal of this walk that we've been called to? The goal is maturing in Christ both as individuals and as a body of believers. Both as individuals and as a body of believers. This is the goal. 
And we're going to continue with this next week as Paul wraps up this thought at the end of chapter 4. But church, I, I said this the last few weeks and I'll say it again. I think the time for us to just sit complacent and to remain as children is over. It's time to grow up. Because we're not going to be the people that he's called us to be if that's the case, but we're also not going to be the church that he needs us to be. If we can so easily be pushed around by the waves and tossed about by every wind of doctrine and, and fall into every scheme that Satan throws at us. It's time to grow up. I want to pray as we prepare our minds for communion. We're going to have a song and then we're going to be led in those thoughts. So let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I love you and I thank you for this time that we've had to be together this morning. And God, my simple prayer is this. God, I pray that we would cling to you. God, I pray that we would know you, that we would fall in love with you. And God, that we would submit ourselves to you and that you would change us. God, change us from the inside out so that we would look less and less like ourselves and more and more like your son, Jesus. I love you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. Precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus, Jesus, you. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We Let the glory of your name be the passion of the church. Let the righteousness of God be a holy flame that burns. Let the saving love of Christ be the
received for communion. I'm blessed. I mean, I'm really, really blessed. Um, I was on the internet on a forum, and somebody asked the question, what is something that everyone should experience at least once in their life? And all these suggestions started rolling in. And as I'm reading through these suggestions, I realized, looking at these list of things that people should experience, how blessed I am. So I'm just going to go through a, a couple of these with you. Um, one disclaimer, um, some of the suggestions were either illegal or immoral, okay? I left those off. Just rest assured that I haven't done most of them. Okay, starting with overseas travel. Yep, yep, got to go to Russia to, to see Abigail. Changed my life, changed my life. Living alone, yep. See the northern lights, yep, saw those in Wyoming. Working in the food industry, yep. First job, never went back. <laughs> uh, being in love, yep. Financial struggle, you know me, I can't handle money. That's the story of my life. <laughs> Build a fire, yep. Raise or care for an animal, plant, or person, yeah. Uh, the plants don't do so well, but the animals and the people did okay. Uh, go on a nature hike, done that, make something useful. Believe it or not, I actually built something and did not nail my hand to a two by four, so we're good there. Cook a meal, uh, I'm still walking around, bachelor cooking, doing okay. Uh, celebrate with others at night, mm -hmm. teach somebody something, yep. No poverty, yeah. Heartbreak. Yeah, travel alone, yeah. Not be stressed about money, food, or shelter. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of there now. Get into a conversation with a random stranger. Well, they're the ones that started, okay? <laughs> I finish it. Okay, yeah, leave me alone. Uh, know the love of a pet, yeah. Get punched in the face, yep. Thank you, high school bully. I could check that one off. Um, Couple that I haven't done yet, like uh, hot air balloon ride. Well, the jury's still out on that. I, I wouldn't, you know, that's kind of on my list. Uh, skydiving. I would do it. Uh, I would have, but now I have a zipper right here, so <laughs> that's that's my my window for that has has closed. Now, as I go through this list, some of you might be saying, "Well, I'm not that blessed." There's a lot of things on that list I haven't done yet. Well, there's one more thing on the list, and it supersedes everything else. And this, this last thing on the list, if you know this last thing, if you have experienced this in your life, then none of the other things on this list matter. And that is to know unconditional love. And I think all of us sitting here can say that we know unconditional love. And it all comes down to John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that we might not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send Christ into the world to condemn it, but to save it. We have the unconditional love of God, and he sent his son to die to seal that deal. So we can know that unconditional love and that we can be blessed above some internet list of earthly things. So let's keep that in mind. Let's keep that close to our hearts that Christ made this sacrifice to bless us and so we can be blessed above all other earthly things. Let's, let's go to God in prayer. Almighty Father in heaven, we come here now to remember the, the sacrifice that your son made for us, that sacrifice that shows us your unconditional love, 
that shows us how you held nothing back from us in wanting to accept your love and in wanting to save us through that love. We pray, Father, that as we partake of this, that we're reminded to celebrate this in our hearts every day of our lives and to show that love to others. And we pray that you bless us and dwell among us as, as we partake of this bread. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Let's continue our thanks. Father, at this time, we partake of this fruit of the vine, representing the, the blood that was spilled, the blood that cleanses us and makes us holy and presentable in your presence. And Father, we ask that we never take this for granted, that we make our lives a, a living sacrifice for the one who died to save us, and that we sacrifice our lives to be a, a living testimony to the lost of this world, for they too need your unconditional love and the salvation that your son brought down by dying and, and raising from the dead and conquering death for us all. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. One more way that I am blessed that wasn't on the internet list. And that is, I'm not rich. I don't have a ton of money. I have enough to make the bills and do some frivolous things. But for the most part, I haven't won a Powerball lottery. Um, I'm not the heir to Bill Gates or Sam Walton or, or any of these people. And I think that's really a good thing because as in, in my research of, of just reading history and, and doing research of, of psychology and behavior and just different things, it, money changes you when you have a ton of money. It, it really does. And not only that, money changes the people around you too. Um, I once read an article by an accountant, and it was like, it was one of those listicles, you know, it's, it's an article, but it's actually just a bullet point list, right? And it's, you know, here's the top 10 things you need to do if you win the lottery. And they're talking mega, you know, Powerball, whatever. And the top two things were number one, get a lawyer. Okay, that makes sense. Number two really surprised me. And that was move, leave town, go live somewhere else. And that really took me back until I thought about it for five minutes. And I realized that if I won the Powerball lottery, I would have all these relatives I didn't know about coming out of the woodwork to find me and that people around me would change and, and I might not even trust you guys which is a terrible thing, and that shows how I would change, right? But there's a third reason I consider that a blessing, and that's because when I go to give to the Lord, I don't think it would mean as much if I wasn't making some kind of sacrifice in my giving. And to that, I, I go back to Luke 21, where it says, And he looked up, and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury, and he saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. And he said, truly, I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them, for they out of all their surplus put into the offering, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had to live on. Now, I have never given all that I had to live on at the moment. Maybe I'm not as strong as, as this widow, but it really means something 
when the first thing I do when I get a paycheck is set money aside to give to the Lord. That means something to me. And I've confessed my history of not being able to handle money to you many times before, but it still fits this situation, is I didn't really have a handle on things until I started honoring God first with what I came in. And once I started doing that, everything else fell into place. And I can have this comfortable existence with occasional periods of regretful, reckless spending that I'm still prone to. So consider that all of you in your financial situations are, are blessed, even if you're struggling, because you have the opportunity to worship God with what he's blessed you with. Let's, let's go to God in prayer as, as we consider this for... Uh, for when you prepare to, to give back to God. Father in heaven, we take this time to acknowledge you as, as the giver of all things. And Father, you have truly blessed us in, in so many ways that we fear that we take them for granted and just because we, we cannot count them all, but we pray that as we contribute to your work here and, and give our support that we realize what a blessing it is to have what we have to give back to you that through this meager gift you're able to do great things and, and through our meager gifts that we are able to, to bring praise and honor and glory to your name. We pray that as we prepare to give that we be mindful and prayerful and do so out of love and, and worship and, and adoration of your greatness. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. All right. <laughs> this is going to be our last song here. If you have any prayer requests, uh, well, if you do, you can text them uh, to Sam. His number is 614-601-1598. It's finishing up across the screen there if you didn't catch all that. So you can go ahead and text Sam any prayer requests that you have at this time. Uh, we're going to go ahead and sing Down to the River to Pray. We're going to do it a little bit differently. The song will be the same, the lyrics. Uh, how we'll start off is the ladies are going to sing the first verse where it talks about uh, the sisters going down and wearing their starry crown at the river. And then the guys will sing verse 2, and then we'll all sing together when we uh, sing about sinners because we're all sinners. So, <laughs> all right. As I we went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sisters, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sisters, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, brothers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, Brothers, let's go down and down to the river. Let's sing and sing together. Come on, everybody. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Bring home. Oh, sing. Let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, 
sinners, let's go down, down to the river to pray. Be seated. That moment when he says, be seated, and I was like, all right, I'll just sit down. Oh, I got to pray. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, did you send a text? Okay. So uh, just a couple of prayer requests here, a few of them. Um, we want to keep praying over Miss Karen, uh, still dealing with some tendinitis, uh, which we know can be very uncomfortable. So praying for her to get better. Uh, a praise is that Clint is doing much better, as I understand. So that is great. He got to go back to work. So praise God for that. Uh, yeah, we can clap for that. Absolutely. We want to keep praying for him that uh, the infections don't come back and that his uh, prosthesis uh, does not cause any more issues, right? So he continues to do well moving forward. Uh, from the Blackwell family, um, Logan and the rest of them are a little bit sad um, because they had to put down their dog, uh, Padfoot, I had to say goodbye to him this week. Um, and he had some health problems that were uh, just really, really difficult. So that's tough for their family. So I want to pray for them and come around them as they deal with that. Um, so, Logan, thanks for asking for prayers for that. I appreciate that. Is there anything else before we pray together? Okay. Let's bow our heads. Lord, as we come before you, um, Lord, we thank you. That, uh, that, Lord, you loved us enough to send your Son uh, to die for us, to rescue us from our sins, from the decisions that we have made that have put us into uh, a terrible place. Lord, the, the things that Adam and Eve did, but also that we have done uh, to hurt each other, to hurt ourselves. But, Lord, you still looked on us and loved us so much to give yourself for us. Uh, and, and not just that, you don't just love us and forgive us, but you want us also to grow. Lord, you desire for us to leave behind the things that we used to do because uh, you have something better for us. You call us to mature and to be like Jesus. So Lord, I pray that we would continue to follow you, that we would submit ourselves to your way, and that we would look more like your son while still looking like ourselves, reflecting your image. Um, Lord, we do want to pray over a few things. We pray over uh, Miss Karen, that you would uh, help her with her tendonitis, that you would give her healing and help her to uh, uh, be able to move past that, to be able to be more comfortable as she walks around. We thank you for Clint. We thank you so much for his healing, how he's doing much better. And we pray that you would please continue to be with him, uh, to watch over him so that infections don't return and so that uh, he just does well with his prosthetic, that... Um, he can uh, continue to, to work and, and live life the way that, uh, uh, that you've called him to. Lord, we, we want to pray for the Blackwells, um, for, for Ben and Katie, for Logan and for Hank, um, as they have said goodbye to uh, their dog, Padfoot. And Lord, uh, that's tough. It's tough to lose a family member. So I pray, Lord, that you would just give them uh, your peace, give them your love and your comfort, and Lord, I pray that we can come around them and comfort them as well in this difficult time. We thank you, Lord, that uh, we know that death is temporary. That there will come a day when all there is is life and more life and more life and more life with you and with each other. So Lord, help us look forward to that day in hope. And may we uh, uh, call upon each other to keep hope and to grow in faith. Uh, so Lord, Lord, that we can uh, see this world transformed by your glory. We pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a great week.
Hey guys, uh, also just one real quick thing. Uh, Aiden wanted me to let you all know. Uh, they've got some puppies at his place. So if anyone wants puppies, they are King Corsos. King Corsos. So they're fostering them. One, a litter of eight. Anyone knows a puppy that wants to go to a good home or the other way around, then talk to Aiden. All right? All right, thanks.